Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Greatest Games on the Blizzard. My name is Marcus Speller. Jonathan Wilson is with me. And with us in the pod, it's Gary L. Smith, sports journalist reporting locally in Ghana and internationally, contributing to the BBC, CNN and the New York Times, to name a few. Gary is also a UNICEF ambassador. Gary, pleasure to have you on the podcast. Yeah, pleasure to be here. It's been normally people when I'm on football pods, they don't mention the UNICEF bit. Uh, but I guess today I need that bit of you know thing on my byline because we are going to talk about a humanitarian mission. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I, I mean, I like to let people know as much as information as possible, uh, and it makes you sound very important. Indeed. Well, Gary, today. Um, we, we're going to uh, the 5th of February 2015 to the Africa Cup of Nations semi-final between Ghana and Equatorial Guinea, which finished 3-0 to Ghana in, in what would be quite a, an explosive evening's entertainment, I suppose you could call it. Why have you chosen this game? Well, I have chosen this game because it's probably the craziest football game I've ever been to. In my in my uh, modest career, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I've seen things. It's not the first time I've been to a game that's been violent. Uh, I've seen a couple here in Ghana, especially where the the big clubs are concerned when they do like refereeing decisions. But this stands out because it was of a host nation of an Africa Cup of Nations that truly believed by this time, by the time this game came that they were going to win the thing. They, mm -hmm. they utterly, totally believed that the stars were going to align, that, you know, the firmament were going to be in place, the gods, whatever it is, were going to make them have this win. And so when they didn't, well, they didn't take kindly to it, to put it very mildly. And Jonathan happened to be in a good area guinea for that one as well. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, you were there. You had you had quite the time at this uh, particular tournament. Um, <laughs> uh, where to begin, really? Well, um, I mean, I think people, you know, it's worth saying just what a strange place Equatorial Guinea is. And it, yeah. I, I've been twice now because they they hosted in two thousand twelve, co-hosted in two thousand twelve with Gabon. Two thousand fifteen, they stepped in at the last minute when Morocco pulled out. I have to say, the re I mean, we won't go into this because we haven't got time. But for very strange reasons, they said it was because of the Ebola outbreak. Um, but of the three countries that had Ebola, uh, only Guinea had qualified, and it would have been in t very easy to test their squad. And you know, Guinea had been playing games because he couldn't play in, in Conakry. They'd been playing games in Casablanca in Morocco. Mm -hmm. So why the Moroccan government suddenly decided that they couldn't couldn't hold the tournament, I've no idea. Um, Equatorial Guinea stepped in, um, and very very strange things ensued. So they they, they they've uh, had had a dictator, te, um, uh, Theodore Nguema, te, well, Theodore Obiang Nguema, uh, who seized power from his uncle in 1978. Uh, and Equatorial Guinea is, by capita, by you know, GDP per, per capita, is one of the wealthiest nations on earth. I think it's like seventh in the overall list. That's incredible when you think and it, about it. Well, it, it, it's, it's sickening. It's absolutely despicable. It's, yeah. it's got an incredible amount of oil, um, but it's all owned by the, the Nguema family. And so there's intense poverty mm -hmm. and, and a, you know, a really brutal and repressive uh, secret police. Um, I, and just you know, the, the, the excess of the, of the ruling family is, is extraordinary. So the son of the president to, who lives in Paris, you know, he, he just bought some, some cars, to, you know, Bentleys and things, just to put outside his apartment, just to look nice. He took some French journalists out and bought 30 suits in an afternoon just to show how rich he was. Uh, I went, just during this tournament, uh, I went looking for a, a monkey reserve, monkey sanctuary, that I never found. But while we were driving about in the interior around Mount Cameroon, which is on the centre of Bioko, the island, as uh, so Ecuador Guinea sort of split into this, the island bit Bioko and then there's the mainland, um, which is very small. Um, and we sort of we, we we came upon sort of the presidential palace, which is enormous, just in the middle of nowhere. So it's a very, very, very odd country. And I think the the level of repression um, makes what happened in this game even more extraordinary than it would have been anyway. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, my my with that fantastic backdrop, I mean, <laughs> just imagine the, the the sort of atmosphere you have. 
the host nation at this stage in the competition, knowing that they were just this close to a famous African Cup of Nations final. They had lobbied hard, just like many other dictatorships across the world and in history have used sports or what we call in this millennial age sports washing, you know, to make their country look good, give themselves some good press. And they had managed by some good luck, you know, a confluence of factors to get this far into the competition. It must be said, um, they were playing some good football. They had some, what do you call it? Um, they were playing attacking football, Jonathan, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Um, occasionally, they did have some luck, you know, some <laughs> referee decisions going their way. Okay, <laughs> let, let, let's, let, let's talk about this very specifically. So they, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they finished second in their group. So they, they were playing... <laughs> <laughs> in their group, they're based in Bata. Now, Bata is um, is the biggest city, but it's not the capital. The capital is Malabo, which is on the island. Bata is the biggest city. It's on, it's on the on the mainland. Um, and there was a little little sign of what was to come before the second group game. When I remember getting there, uh, would have been two or three hours because they, they played double headers. So it would have been two or three hours before the first game, and there was already a big press of of Equatorial Guinea fans. And police were trying to sort of the, the 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 two stadiums, the two big stadiums, one the one in Malabo and the one in in Bata, were both very similar. The one in Bata was a bit bigger, but they were both in their own complexes with loads of other sort of sporting arenas. So one in, in Malabo had a huge Olympic sized swimming pool, which people might remember Eric the Eel, the, the swimmer from the Olympics, who sort of yeah. gained this sort of notoriety, and that was where he trained. So these huge sporting complexes, they each had a hotel in them. Um, and because I'd been there in 2012, I realised this hotel was the place to stay because you're right on site. It takes away a load of the hassle uh, in, in Malabo. Um, but what it means is there's only one point of ingress. And so you've got huge build-ups. On the odd occasion, you've got big crowds. There was, you've got huge build-ups at those gates. So the second group game, there was a load of problems outside the ground. Um, and when I got there, the police were sort of holding people back and, and had batons raised this is sort of five, six hours before that game kicked off. Uh, when I came out afterwards, the gate had been ripped off the off the gateposts. Uh, so that was a little sign that things were a little bit more... Um, people were not quite as repressed as they had been three years earlier, put it that way. There, there, there was not quite the level of control. But they, got, they get through the group in second place, uh, won one game and drew two. And that meant that I think they should have been playing the quarterfinal in Ebebien. Now, Ebebien's tiny, um, and they hadn't used that in 2012, and they hadn't used Mongomo in 2012. Now, Mongomo's where, where Ghana played their group. They they lost to Senegal in their first game. They went through winning the two games after that. Um, and the pitches in those two stadiums were terrible because they'd been laid sort of five or six weeks before the tournament. So you couldn't play football on them. And then they decided that you couldn't have Equatorial Guinea playing in Ebebien because the stadium's too small. So they decided to move all the quarterfinals to Malabo and, and Bata. So this is all done at the last minute. So they have this game against Tunisia, this quarterfinal in Bata. And Tunisia, that Tunisia team, were a horrible team. <laughs> they were physical. They were cynical. They were the kings of shithousery. And the thing is, they were quite a good football team. They could have just played football. So the first half of this game, Tunisia commit 19 fouls. Take a Guinea's four. <laughs> so you can see how they're playing. Second half, Tunisia, 20 minutes to go. They get the goal. They won the look. And you sort of think, oh, this is done. And Tunisia are the kings of, of killing time. And you sort of, they're wasting time. They're feigning injury. They're in the referee's face. There's this magnificent, I, I, well, no, let's let's deal with the penalty first. So in, in, in injury time, <laughs> um, there is a complete nonsense of a penalty given. Oh, it's, 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 oh, so, I Ivan Bolado, the Equatorial Guinea player, has the ball sort of, he's going towards the goal line, he's way to the left of goal, he is inside the box, and it's uh, Matluti sort of, he's near him, a little bit of jockeying, and down he goes. And the referee, Rajinder um, <laughs> Palsad, Sichern, gives the penalty. And I remember in the press box, mm. And it's very rare this happens that you get a universality of response. I remember, you know, when 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 Germany got the fifth against Brazil in two thousand fourteen, 
And I remember everybody in the press box had the same expression on their faces, open mouth, looking around. And this was similar. Everybody simultaneously burst out laughing. Yeah. It was a penalty that was so bad. The decision was so awful. It was just funny. And the, uh, and there was all kinds of conspiracy theories that Equatorial Guinea had been told you would get to at least the semi-final or you'll get to the final or whatever. Yeah. I actually think what happened was Say Chern had just gone, I'm so sick of these Tunisians. I'm just... Was going to give it. Oh, oh! It was very much a ref- the re- when when he went down. You, you could almost hear the referee go, "Thank you very much." <laughs> you know, and he he oh, got suspended you. for it afterwards. He, he, well, you did, you did, you did, you did, you did, you did. You did, you did. So mm. um, again, like I said, they played some attacking football, and they had some help from the referees as well. But Jonathan, you have forgotten the tiny detail about the outrageous prices. And uh, rewards that the players were being given. I mean, the president was promising them anything from hundred thousand dollars a match per player, you know, to win and and all that. I mean, that is how badly they wanted it. Mm. So, with this background, we all knew that it was going to be a difficult game for even journalists, and because it was a state, you know, repressive regime and all that, we can pick the feelers out that you know this is not a place to joke, you know, joke with the police and stuff like that. Now, my hotel was about a um, 20 minute walk, 15 minute walk from, from the stadium. And also to give a bit of context as to how bizarre this country was, they had highways with paved roads like Norway or Sweden, you know, quality, like really, really good, huge um, edifices, you know, marking this anniversary or this anniversary on the main roads, then you take a detour right into the town and the contrast could not be starker. You well, know, but Montgomery, where, where Ghana were, was the, because Montgomery is, is the sort of the hometown of, of, of the uh, Ben Grimmer family, yeah. yeah. And so Montgomery, it's, it's, I mean, it's basically a, a village and it's, it's, a village, yes. it's you're very, very poor, except it's got this huge Italian-style clock tower in the middle. It's got a five-star hotel on the edge of town, which I stayed in in 2012 because I, I went by road from Bata to get to Libreville. And so I went through Montgomery, which wasn't even staged in games then. It was one of those places I went through thinking, well, I'll never come back here. Three years later, there I am. And um, they had this, they built this basilica because they wanted to get the Pope to come and visit. So this huge basilica, 8,000 capacity basilica on the hill outside Montgomery, which is just a, a little village in the middle of a forest. I mean, it's mm. a ridiculous place. And a huge yeah. library as well. They've, they've had a, a, which I think the Americans have funded, this enormous library in Montgomery. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I hope that, I mean, everybody gets a picture of how grotesque, I think that's the correct word. Grotesque is the word, yeah. yeah. And yeah. So anyway, the game is Tunisia. They, they, they score the penalty. The player who scores it is um, Javier Balboa. Balboa. Uh, Balboa yeah. is... Rocky, Rocky! Yeah. <laughs> he was... Can I, just, can I just say, Jonathan, though, that, that when the penalty is given, the Equatorial Guinea players celebrate as if they've just scored. Yeah. Like, and and that, it, it's almost as if to say, ah, yes, yeah, the... the that the system works. Thing, you know? <laughs> and it You'll would, be okay, lads. Don't but worry Balboa about it. is by a million miles their best player. Um, mm. They had a couple of decent players. And, um, in Sway? Played for Middlesbrough? Yeah, in Sway. Played for Middlesbrough and Birmingham. But uh, mm-hmm. Balboa, had, you know, he'd, uh, he'd been born in Madrid. He'd come up through the Real Madrid youth system. He played seven games for Real Madrid. He played a handful of games for Benfica. I think it was at Estoril by this point. But he was a proper footballer. And Sue was, you know, a slightly lower tier or slightly less skillful player, but I, I guess an equally useful player. They were the two best players by far. Um, and then he scores, in extra time, he scores a brilliant, brilliant free kick uh, to beat Tunisia. But the, the, this game, the celebrations afterwards, are, are like nothing I've ever seen before. So the next morning, we go to the airport in Bata to go to Malabo for the, the quarterfinals there. And... Everybody is drunk. Literally everybody. Our taxi driver was drunk. Everybody at the airport was drunk. Security at the airport were drunk. And we went to check in. And Tamor, uh, a friend of mine, a photographer, uh, he was working for Jeanne Africa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, he, he had his, his boarding pass on his, on his phone. And he hands it over to the guy behind the desk, who is, is pissed. And he inadvertently presses archive. And because there's no Wi-Fi in the airport, he can't get it out of the archive. So... Same or stuck. You can't, you can't get on the plane. So I was with Nick Ames and the guard and a couple of other people. And we went to the cafe. And who should be in the cafe but Lauren Poku, 
who for a long time was the top Ivorian forward for a long time had been the top scorer in Cup of Nations history. Then Samuel Eto'o took his record. So we're sitting there having this <laughs> nice chat with Lauren Poku, doing this interview. I, you know, he's, he's since died, uh, Poku. Um, and you know, great privilege to meet him. And we we mentioned so half an hour later, we think, oh, now Tamar's getting on. And we go back, Tamar's in the seat, like where the, the woman checking him in should have been. And he's doing it himself because everybody else is too drunk to manage the computers. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, the whole, the whole thing is... So, it's the, I mean, on the one hand, it was very touching that they were so excited about it and really their first ever sporting achievement, certainly in mm-hmm. football. But on the other hand, it did create this dangerous expectation. Mm-hmm. Indeed, yeah. Well, well, let's talk a little bit more about that um, after a quick break, gentlemen. Back in a moment. Welcome back to the Greatest Games on uh, the Blizzard. Now, Gary, we've talked a lot about Equatorial Guinea and, uh, yeah, and the but situation it's an, there. It's, a, it's important to set that, yes. that, that backdrop because what happens in there, you know, you immediately understand. Because, of course. like I said, my hotel is 15 minutes away. So I set off early about well, three or four hours before the game. I walk, um, get close to the hotel. Then I see a police presence there. And I remember something somebody had told me. Always go along with your passport. Carry it always. Then, instinctively, I just check my backpack and my passport is not there. Mm -hmm. In a dictatorship, a repressive country, where a policeman can grab you and say, where are your documents? If you don't have it, he's beating you instantly, like no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So then... The decision about, because I see people running, and like Jonathan has said, I mean, it's a huge game. Everybody wants to see the players. And so the even three hours to kick off, the place is filling up really quickly. I make a make quick mental calculation. Do I go to the stadium without my passport? Or do I go back to the hotel, go and get it, come back and risk joining a longer queue? Common sense, you know, takes over at this point. And I just decided to risk it because I'll leave it at the gate anyway because I figured that if I show up at the gate and I have my passport and my tag, they're going to let me in faster, right? So I go back to the hotel and um, I am told that the woman who is cleaning my room because I have left like 15 minutes before, the woman who is cleaning my room says, I can't come in until she's done. I mean, this is my room. (laughs) This is my room. (laughs) So I, I wait a while, she's done, and then I go in there, uh, pick my passport and come back. So when I come back, I meet this humongous crowd, I mean, long story short, pushing, shoving, um, the few words of Spanish, because, you know, they speak Spanish, and mm-hmm. yeah, that I can master, then I get into the state as well. So that's one level of stress already done, then, you know, everything else, the internet is half working, typical African Cup of Nations fair. You know, you are looking like uh, you are looking for the password. You can't find it. Um, you have to use your phone Wi-Fi as a hotspot. And this is, I mean, not 2020. This is mm-hmm. Equatorial Guinea. I mean, Wi-Fi hotspots don't just work. You know, yeah. because the internet. Jonathan, I remember the internet was crazy expensive, like crazy expensive. And they have only one cell phone network, which of course belongs to the Weber, I mean, family as well. So yeah, <laughs> you can imagine. Oh, what, what, so, so, so it's an ordeal, certainly, for, for the journalists getting in there. I mean, I, my goodness. So, I mean, what I'd like to ask you, actually, Gary, um, as loath as I am to go away from the kind of the, the, the kind of the experiences of getting to the ground and the political climate and all that kind of stuff, was we haven't actually mentioned Ghana, the football team themselves, managed, of course, by Avram Grant. There was a number of players that, that, that fans of the Premier League will be familiar with. You had Andre and Jordan Ayew in there, Daniel Amati in there, young, young player. Christian Atsu, of course, had a great tournament as well. You know, and they had players who were, were playing in some of the top leagues. But Asimo Jan, although he, he missed this game, uh, yeah. he got injured against Guinea in the, in the quarterfinal. Yeah, so, so a very talented Ghana side. And so surely you must have been thinking, OK, Equatorial Guinea, you know, you've had your fun. <laughs> but I mean, the, the 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 kind of decisions we'll see in this game for them to beat Ghana would be particularly outrageous. Yes. So you, you must have been fairly confident that Ghana were going to win this game. Yes, especially because of the experience. I mean, uh, remember that Harrison Affle had been in the team since at least 2010. Because you know he he had come into 
sold out Ghana's long left back problem. John Boy, who now plays you know in France, was also quite good. Uh, he had been a regular. He had been a pariah also because of his infamous. Uh, you know when Ghana had the airplane flown to Brazil for the World Cup because they were demanding bonuses and whatnot. He was the symbol of that movement because he was one caught on camera actually kissing the wax of dollars. <laughs> That's right. I remember. Yes. I remember. So he, 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 he became the symbol of that, that catastrophe for Ghana. Um, they had Jonathan Mensah, who was sort of in his prime. Um, among the Premier League players, he also had Babaraman, who is still a Chelsea player but never gets a game because he's part of the uh, long list of Chelsea loanees. <laughs> yeah. Then Mubarak Wakaso, Mifri uh, Aqua, Christina Chu, Jordan Ayu, Andre Ayu. At this time, Jordan was a hugely divisive figure in Ghana because he was not as consistent as he has now. You know, his talent was there, his potential was there, but people didn't really trust him. But in the absence of Asamwaja, there weren't a lot of options. You know, so that was Ghana's team. And then um, the Victoria Guinea also had um, Opono, who was a reliable goalkeeper, one of their better players. Um, the Vue in Bele, uh, they had Rui, Riven, a guy called Kike, which was his nickname, Ivan and Long Balboa, uh, Ivan Edu, and then Emiliano Yusue. So close to what was their best team as well. And that is how they, 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 they lined up. But mm. the context, I remember the match, pre match previews was about how Equatorial Guinea, and especially the state run media. So they riled the people up. You know, just to get them emotionally charged, and which is why later you would see these scenes. The Equatorial Guinea we were ranked 118th in the world. You know, and Ghana was I mean, Ghana. We were always doing well and all that. So um, this was the background to it. I mean, the second Africa Cup of Nations semi-final. The first one had been played, and so they were expecting that we were going to be in the final. And then kickoff, kickoff happened. <laughs> Ghana were red hot favorites. Um, yeah, but Equatorial Guinea really felt it was just as the journalists who in our minds knew that, I mean, come on, we're not going to be in it. But of course, we couldn't see that. <laughs> Jonathan, what were your experiences like going to the ground and, and soaking up the atmosphere? Did you think that there was there was trouble brewing? I mean, you mentioned that earlier on in the tournament that you felt that there were tensions. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, it was only in retrospect I sort of... Um saw any significance in what happened early in the tournament. I just sort of thought it would have been bad management, it had been a bit of a crush developed and mm-hmm. um yeah, there was one story which disturbed me, which is an Al Jazeera journalist said he'd he'd seen a, a fan with a gun. But I, I didn't know I didn't didn't entirely believe him to be honest. Um <laughs> Jonathan, but, this was like a tour, like anything, anything was possible. Yeah, I mean anything was yeah. possible, yeah. <laughs> but so the, the, the um Cote d'Ivoire had, had beaten um Guinea uh, sorry, not Guinea, uh, uh DR Congo the day before. Mm-hmm. In in battle, so uh, Nick Ames and I were both there from the Guardian. So we just tossed a coin for who who covered which game. We were both going to both games, but who actually wrote the report? And the way it fell, I did the first semi, which was a mistake, as it turns out. Well, for me, yeah, great for Nick. And so I, I was just here doing uh, doing Blizzard work. Um, so we must have flown in the morning of the game, but I was still, I, I, I still had my room in the hotel, which was you know 150 yards. From, from the ground it was within the same complex so getting to the ground was was very easy for me but and i'm sure gary will remember this the press box was tiny like it was two rows of seats i guess maybe 50 seats total maybe 60 pushing it and then there was the radio cabins so we'd managed to early in the tournament we commandeered one of the radio cabins um for the basically i, I mean brian oliver the the legendary former sports editor of the, of the observer who did loads of Cups of Nations. This was his first one back after a while away. And I don't know if you remember, Gary, there was that very fierce Nigerian press officer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't remember her name, who, who, who ran things there. <laughs> but Brian charmed her in the first week. It was the most magical thing to watch this sort of <laughs> late 50s, red-faced British man charming this, this kind of absolutely ferocious Nigerian press officer. And every press conference followed exactly the same pattern. Where Brian would be sat in the middle of the front row and she would go, right, first question. And she'd pretend to be looking around the room. Brian. Every single press conference, Brian <laughs> Brian got the first question. And somehow he persuaded her to let let the British press have this cabin, 
which meant that when the Algerians were there, and the Algerian press was loads of them and they were quite aggressive. There was never any fight. We just got the cabin to ourselves. The problem was Brian always took a tin of sardines for every game. So the thing just stank of sardines. Because you've got to remember, it's like 35 degrees. Is he marking his territory or something? What's but but what, we, what we realised was there was, um, there was a pizza restaurant uh, just outside, the, the just over the road from the stadium complex. So we could ring them and get them to deliver pizzas to the cavern. So they'd have to kind of come through all these crowds of people and through all the security. But, you know, they, they got through. So we could get there several hours before kickoff and get them to deliver pizza sort of half an hour before the game started. And that was, but we, for some reason, the semi-final, we couldn't do that. So Nick and I were, were sat outside because we got there early. We were middle of the front row, which turned out to be a mixed blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds all right, Jonathan. Doesn't so, they get pizza so, delivered? As a... <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> always falls on its feet. So, so basically, I mean, for us journalists, yes. But to the game, right? The game starts. National anthems. Um, with all the background, you would understand why the people would belt out their national anthem in open anticipation. So the game starts. Ghana are surprisingly for favourites, disjointed. Like, nothing is working, passes are going this way, that way. The Equatorial Guinea seem quite, you know, void or whatever it is. But then, two decisions start riling up their fans. Because while Ghana is not playing well and so on and so forth, um, by the 34th, 30th minute, the Equatorial Guinea were having, you know, one or two chances. They were not converting. The crowd were hooping and hollering and all that. The ref gives a decision that they are not happy about. I think it was the goalkeeper who had, you know, sort of come out and, 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 and cluttered, you know, cleared the ball because he was feeling all very heroic, you know, like a keeper sweeper. And the ref gave a foul in favor of Ghana, you know. So they were not happy about that at first. And then, I think on the 35th minute, Ghana had a penalty. Did you, um, Ovono charge off his line again when the ball was coming? And then Kwesi Apia, the Ghana striker, is fouled. Now, quick anecdote about Kwesi Apia. He was, Avram Grant had just called this guy, who was in League 2, by the way, and he was mm-hmm. playing in the Ghana national team. Now, here in Ghana, because of how proud we are of our football heritage, it is almost heretical that a player from the third tier of any country in the world should be in the national team. I mean, people believe that national team is that good that it should be only Premier League level players in any country. Yeah. He was a real journeyman in England as well. I mean, he'd been to so many different clubs in the lower leagues. But he was in Cambridge at this point. He was yeah. in Cambridge at this point. So he was like, but people had liked him because he was a cool guy. He was, you know, he never liked him in trouble. And he was enterprising. He was not, definitely not world class, but he did the simple things. Anyway, you could clearly see he followed instruction. So he charges onto a ball. The keeper comes out to try and tackle it. He mistimes it. Jordan Ayew steps up. And even at this time, everybody knows when Jordan steps up, like for a penalty, he never misses. And Jordan, by the way, still has never missed a penalty for the Black Stars for the Ghana national team. He's that good at it. So when he steps up, I mean, everybody knows he's going to score and he scores. Uh, now, in the immediate aftermath of the goal, Marcus, here's the interesting thing. The Ghana players are celebrating. And I remember the journalists screaming at the Ghana players, get back, get back. So inadvertently, <laughs> inadvertently, they alert the Equator. Guinean players that, oh shoot, these guys are not ready. They put the ball in the centre line and pass quickly. Then, the ref calls them back. Yeah. I mean, this ref has balls. Because to do that against the host nation, you know what I mean? So the ref calls them back and the players are absolutely livid. Yeah. But that's what I mean, Gary. That's what we were saying at the start when we were saying about this, that Ghana was such favourites. You thought to yourself, what kind of decisions is the referee <laughs> going to have to make? And if had he have not pulled them up for that, no, but he, he had to. In... I mean, it was the right decision because half, half a Ghana team was, yeah. was still. In, no, in I the know, wrong Jonathan, half. but in the if in the context in the, in in the in this sort of um, 
you know the the, the the you know the heat of the action i suppose you know he may well yeah. have bottled it yeah i mean the, I, the, just the first the first sense i had that the crowd something might be brewing was a little bit before the goal when uh, Ivan Edu, who was the centre forward, who was very much sort of the like the playboy of a team, he, he was very popular, and he dispossessed uh, Mubarak Wakaso, and it was right in front of the linesman. The linesman didn't give anything, and the referee Erika Togo from Gabon gives a free kick. Now, I, I, I honestly don't know if it was a foul or not. It's interesting the linesman didn't give it, and the Equatorial Guinea players react very badly to that. There's four or five of them converge on a Togo. And there's a couple of bottles thrown. And when I say bottles, yeah, everybody in Equatorial Guinea, because it's so hot and humid, they carry around these two-litre plastic bottles. So, it, yeah, they're, they're bottles. Realistically, they're not going to do that much damage. I mean, yeah, obviously it's not a good thing to be hit by a two-litre water bottle full of water, but it's not a glass bottle. Um, so there's a couple of those thrown. I was like, oh, that's a bit. Didn't expect that. But then when this, this is called back as they try and take the quick kickoff, suddenly there's dozens of these being thrown and then mainly being thrown at the Ghana players we're still celebrating down in the corner yeah. so there's a way to our left as we were in the press box so the, the there's the main stand opposite us or, or sorry I guess we were in the main stand then there's a big stand opposite us the ends are sort of there's a running track so they're curved they're quite a long, long way from the pitch the Ghana fans of whom I'm guessing were four or five hundred maybe does that sound about right to you guys? Yeah, yeah. yes because they still, they still have floating fans <laughs> yeah, so, so they were in the corner of, of that stand away to the left, sort of. And so, so, you know, they were over there, but at this stage, the bottles are all being thrown at the Ghana players and just generally under the pitch. Everything calms down, and then Ghana go and score again. <laughs> um, you know, so in injury time, the end of the first half, and it, it, it's Atsu, who was by far Ghana's best player in that tournament, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he. he he, you know, he he was exactly in Equatorial Guinea corner. Uh, really good break. He drives forward, and he squares it for uh, Wakaso to score. At which there are hundreds of these water bottles being thrown, and the only way the Ghana players can get off the pitch at half time, they they, they gather in the centre circle to get as far away from the state from the stands as possible, and the only way they can get off is riot police putting their shields up, in the you know the 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 old Testudo thing from the Roman army of kind of having the shields above their head. Yeah. And that's how they get off at, at half time. And so suddenly this this very repressed you know, nation yeah. it's as if they sense, hang on, the police can't actually stop us if we all throw bottles at the same time. Yeah. And it was a very, very strange atmosphere because I, I, when I was sort of thinking, how are we going to even get back on the pitch at the start of the second half? I, I, I don't see how this game goes on. Yeah, Gary, how did Ghana, when they got in a half-time, you know, the 2 nil up, and obviously it's a very, very tasty environment, shall we say, what what was their reaction? You know, how did they deal with the situation? They were really calm, and, I'll, and because we've explained so much, this is where Ghana actually win the game. Hmm. The more riled up the host nation gets, the calmer Ghana become because mainly of Avram Grant. Now, yeah. Abraham Grant was brought in to be what, let's say, Carlo Ancelotti is brought into teams to do. Mm-hmm. When there's a heated atmosphere, you can trust Don Carlo to come in. Okay, simmer down, simmer down, simmer <laughs> yeah, down. That's right, yeah. Exactly. That's why he was brought in. Ghana had come from the debacle of the World Cup, you know, uh, money being flown to Brazil. Everybody hated the national team here in Ghana. We were at an all time low in terms of support. You know, they had been on TV before the tournament, begging the country, people in the country, um, to forgive them, that sort of thing. Now, Grant basically, we are told later, he calmed them in the dressing room and told them, guys, we've got this. Play the ball, ball around, don't do much, and just keep going at it. So they are calm. I mean, and they can sense that they've got this in the back. At this point, their concern is for their safety. So that's how the second half begins. So that means even to get on the pitch, they have to have a riot police. You know, so you got the tunnel, and the riot police then kind of make the tunnel longer with their shields. And what I thought was really impressive was Avon Grant walked out first. Yeah. He led them out, yeah. and he doesn't doesn't look at anybody. He just walks straight ahead, and there's bottles landing all around him, and he just walks through it. And I sort of thought, you know, Avon Grant's got quite a mixed. Um, uh, reputation in Britain, 
but that was genuinely heroic and genuinely brilliant leadership. Mm-hmm. Well, he was his leadership can be quite hands off. He was criticised, wasn't he, uh, when he was Ghana manager for being a little bit too hands off. But there, I don't want to say hands on approach, but he certainly, as you say, Jonathan, showed leadership qualities. Every every Ghana player you speak to about Abraham Grant will tell you that this criticism about being hands off was only because he never stayed in Ghana. He preferred to coach the team from abroad. Now we only saw him in Ghana on Sky Sports. Because they invited him into the studio, he'd be talking about the Premier League and Chelsea boss. So it always riles people up that this guy should be here watching the local league. You know what I mean? Scouting for players. Yeah. yeah. But when he came, the players all loved him because he knew how to. I mean, as a man manager, he was fantastic. One of the best we've had in recent years. So, I mean, the second half um, continued in the same vein and we basically knew that the game was done and dusted. Andrea, you... Um, scored on 73 minutes, by which time things were actually going to, <laughs> you know. And then just, just around, around that time that we started really feeling that, you know what, hang on, something bad is going to happen. Yeah. I, do, do you know what was interesting is that the way Ghana celebrated that third goal where they're all sort of dancing around, I, <laughs> I don't blame them for one second, you know, because... It, because, you know, they, it's essentially sealed their place in a final... And they've taken a lot from the from the Ho fans, but I did think it was a what would be the word? I suppose a, a, a slightly ballsy celebration uh, with bottles flying around and they were all dancing. Yeah, I know what you mean, Marcus. But the second half, once it began, was actually relatively calm. It sort of felt mm. like the the you know the, the storm had been weathered. But then when that third goal goes in and it's you know definitely game over, suddenly everything gets a lot lot worse very very quickly. And so the bottles are being thrown aren't just the plastic bottles. There's also glass beer bottles. You know, I, I walked around the pitch afterwards, and there was there was plates. There was, was I found a bit of mirror. Um, <laughs> you know, proper missiles, and they began to be directed at the Ghana fans, and that was much much more dangerous because you know they were just there. Whereas at least the players, you had the running track, they could go in the middle of the pitch. Whereas you know those Ghana fans were totally you know defenseless. So they initially they retreated to the back of the stand, which meant that they couldn't be got at from the from the long stand opposite us, which I think was the west stand. Uh, but the, the fans in that end, the the south stand, could still throw things at them. And then the police led the Ghana fans down onto the track. Now there were all kinds of stories that came out that they they forced the gate or something. Now that was not what I saw. And again, when I looked at the gates at the front, they hadn't been forced. You know, they they it was a it was, a, it was a bolt, but it was a magnetic bolt that could be released remotely. So either somebody in same security had released it or the, the police had, had, had pulled it back. And so they were they were on the track. The police were around them, protecting them, eventually took them out of the stadium. Um, they then clear uh, the, the, the stand we were in. So there's loads of, um, loads of fans go along the sort of the, the passageway in front of the press box. And Nick, who was next to me, um, his, he was sort of packing up his stuff because obviously we realised this is, you know, get your laptop, get, get everything out of the way. And he, his, his laptop charger falls down into the passageway in front, at which one of these guys who's kind of being heard at the stadium by these angry riot police sort of picks it up and kind of gives it back to him. It's a nice sort of <laughs> remarkable sort of gentlemanly, kindly act. Um, but as, as Nick's sort of flapping, it's sort of his his the lead kind of goes across and swings right in front of my nose and back again, and Calf by this point have turned off the cameras, so there's no official footage of any of this. But there was a South African journalist from AP, who was filming it on his iPhone from the back of the box, and he sold it around the world the next day. So the next morning, I'm in the hotel watch, and it had um, uh, France Van Cat on the on the TV, a French news channel, and suddenly I see myself sitting down. <laughs> Tapping at my laptop, looking up at Nick as he's kind of panicking, flapping, putting everything away. This cable going across the front of my face, and you can very, very clearly literally me going, "Oh, for fuck's sake, Nick, sit down!" <laughs> <laughs> and this is repeated every fifteen minutes all day. Just me going, "Oh, for fuck's sake, Nick, sit down." <laughs> well, um, I remember, I, I remember seeing the pictures back home, Jonathan, thinking, "They are it's those bloody English causing trouble abroad again," you know. And then, and then they, they bring in a helicopter. And the, the helicopter, you know, they, they lower it right down over the stand to, I don't know, like 30 feet above the stand. So, I mean, really, really close. 
So there's, there's like this wind. And what I remember is uh, Orange, who were the sponsors of the tournament, they'd handed out all these sort of inflatable hands and the, the clappy stick things. And they were flying everywhere. And there's bits of paper flying everywhere. This huge storm of these orange inflatables as these fans are being driven out. And then they, eventually they drop uh, smoke grenades to kind of to clear it fully. Um, but I also remember Tamor, you know, who we spoke about having his problems at the airport. He was you know, he was down pitch side because he, he was uh, you know, taking, taking photographs. And Pepsi were one of the other sponsors of the tournament. And there was these inflatable Pepsi cans in the corners. And he was sort of cowering behind one of them as these missiles are sort of raining. And he can't move because as soon as he moves from behind this Pepsi can, he's going to be in range of the missiles. So it was it was really kind of, you know, in the press box, he felt slightly insulated from it. But I could see, you know, Tamor was in big trouble. I could see these Ghana fans in big trouble. Okay. And the most moving thing I saw afterwards was a, was a ball boy who was, I don't know, like eight or nine years old, like just shaking and in tears, just oh, absolutely yeah. terrified by what had happened. And they, the Ghana fans were taken out of the stadium and in this sort of complex, they sort of put them on a roundabout in the complex, on this big grassy roundabout. And so sort of they, they created a ring around them. Which I guess temporarily kept them safe, but it was, you know, it really was very, <laughs> very unpleasant. Yeah. I mean, have you spoken to any of, uh, of the fans, Gary, that were in the, in the Ghana end, or, or if you haven't, you know, how was it reported on all this in Ghana? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, it was going to be reported only one way. I mean, of course. Uh, <laughs> underdog, you know, we are being repressed by a nation of unsportsmanlike people, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, so, like Jonathan said, the fans themselves were being attacked. That's the Ghana fans were being attacked by the Equatorial mm-hmm. Guinean fans. So they had to set the, the stands and get onto the pitch. So the fans were now sort of with the Ghana players, right? And the police personnel in the stadium were totally did not know how to do. But then at a the point, we saw a group of police who seemed very organized and they knew exactly what to do. It didn't occur to us, but later we would learn, but those were special forces flown from Angola. Uh. Now, Angola was also, or is still a repressive regime. So I, I imagine uh, the president in Guema of Equatorial uh, Guinea just called the Santos in Angola and said, yo, the Santos, but yo, I need a couple of guys here. Uh, <laughs> Restore some law and order. You know, here. Yeah, so, can you help me? I say, yeah, 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 I can send all my best control guys. Uh, let's let's see what we can do. So, the Angolans were the one who did it. Because Equator Guinean police officers were completely out of their depth, you know, about everything that was happening. So, um, at this time, Jonathan, remember also, I mean, in all the, the, the noise, you might have forgotten, the Equator Guinean Minister of Sports had gone into the press box or wherever the loudspeaker in the stadium had appealed for Carl a couple of times. Nobody had minded him. Well, and the Equatorial Guinea so, players, to be fair to them, they were appealing for Carl and they had been at half time. So, I mean, they, mm-hmm. the players themselves, yeah. no blame on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, there's an important point that probably annoyed the people before the match as well because it had dominated local press. Marcos, the referee for this game was from Gabon. Now think of an England semi-final World Cup game where the ref is from Scotland, Ireland. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be too too pleased to be honest with you, Gary, if that was the case. Yeah. <laughs> So there was that also. But what, yeah. what I thought he did really well was when he brings the players back. So there's been like a 40 minute stoppage. He brings them back. We still sort of 15 minutes of injury time to play. And that takes maybe five minutes maximum. Mm-hmm. It's just bang, get it done. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Nick was writing the piece yeah. for the Guardian. So, Sorry, go, go on, Gary. They, 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 they also had another conspiracy. Now, Equatorial Guinea had beaten Gabon 2 0 in the group stage. So, I'm not sure which genius decided to give this ref the game, you know, because there were so many extraneous factors that were screaming, don't do this, mm-hmm. because of regional rivalry. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the factors that I had spoken about as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was it. Yeah. So, so I, is it? because Nick was, yeah, Nick was doing the report, I, I went to the press conference um, 
you know, to 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 get you know quotes on you know on you know what players experienced, and then I you know, I was done. I had no more immediate work, so I then took on the absolutely vital role of going back to the hotel and saying to them, please, please, please keep the bar open because there's going to be a lot of journalists like really want a beer and don't shut at ten thirty or whatever time you normally shut it. So I don't know if you remember Gary, but we all we all gathered outside the hotel that night, and at that bar on the on the terrace, but. Uh, and we, we and yeah, cause, because everybody was sort of really, you know, the, the huge adrenaline rush. I, I know, I know. Yeah. Everybody wanted a few beers just to calm down. And that was the night when Nick Cavell from the BBC, he he they, he left with uh, another guy from the BBC, uh, Matthew Kenyon, maybe? I can't remember who it was. One of the other BBC guys, they leave, I don't know, like midnight, 1am, something like that. And the next thing we know, and this is incredible. I can't believe we didn't didn't notice this. The next thing we know is we see pictures of him on Twitter with his foot, you know, his ankle completely in a plaster. And there was between, like, you know, you had the hotel and it went up the road and it was a stadium. You turned left and there, there was like the swimming pool and some tennis courts. And there was these big drainage ditches by the by the tennis courts. And Nick Cavell had just fallen on these drainage ditches and smashed his ankle. So he, he missed the final. I had to cover it from his hotel room, and and it was, couldn't have been more than a hundred yards from us, and we didn't hear him at all. So that that was the end of a very very strange night with poor Nick doing yeah. his ankle. Yeah, the real victim of it. So Nick, yeah, the story. I had worked, I was working also with Nick and Matthew Kenyon. It was he was there at the detail to cover um, Steve Crossman. Yeah, that's right. It was. It was Steve. Steve yeah, you're right. Crossman. Yeah, it was. Steve Crossman, who is now doing five yeah. by yes. So Steve Crossman was had just started out at the beginning. and this was his first major tournament or something. So um we are walking, okay, on this quiet road. We had just come the streets were all littered with water bottles, you know, police had cracked down so everybody had fled. And we are all talking about it. And if memory serves, I was in front with somebody. Now Marcus, think about it. The next thing we hear is <laughs> like <laughs> we are like it's been a strange evening, so you don't know. Yeah. Then while well, we take about two steps, and then we hear. <laughs> oh I mean, to be fair, yeah. it's not the worst sound you've heard all evening, is it? <laughs> Checking the drain, and the camel is, is is kissing kissing the drain. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he and he missed w- w- one of the most extraordinary penalty shootouts I've ever ever witnessed. Well, just on TV, of course. Uh, which was the final, of course. And, and don't worry, Gary, we're not going to talk about that game. We were here to talk about the semi final, so we won't go over the uh, over the, the Ivory Coast win. But all we'll say is that when all was said and done in Equatorial Guinea that year, it was Boubacar Barry who had the <laughs> final word. <laughs> As he often does. Um, my goodness. Well, Gary, it's been a pleasure talking to you about this game and, and all the stuff off it. I mean, obviously, the, the stuff that happened off the field was unsavoury, but it was very, very interesting indeed. And, uh, and Jonathan, your experiences in, in Africa Cup of Nations is always priceless for my money. Um, but Gary, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the pod today. Absolute pleasure. Uh, for more stories like that, do check out theblizzard.co.uk. Uh, but thank you again, Gary. Thank you, Jonathan. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, have a good one.